In this video, I'm going to show you how to use Adobe Photoshop to transform your night photos from this to this. Hey everyone, Alvin here, and today we're back with another Photoshop editing tutorial, editing one of my favorite aircraft, ANA's EV Jet, that I caught at the observation deck at Tokyo Haneda's International Airport. Night shots in aviation photography can be really challenging to take and edit, but can also be really rewarding when you get it right. One of the biggest things working against you in night photography is obviously the lack of light. So you're gonna have to be doing one of three things. Use a slower shutter, a wider aperture, or increase your ISO if you can't do either of the first two. Unless you're photographing stationary aircraft, you're not really going to be able to simply put your camera onto a tripod and set a 10 second exposure to get the cleanest shot. So you're likely going to have to be dealing with a fair bit amount of noise and or motion blur. Also, depending on the amount of ambient light in your scene, you're likely going to have to recover a lot of the colors and light especially directly on the aircraft. Throughout this video, I'm gonna be showing you the techniques and tools that I use to help tackle all of these things. Keep in mind that this tutorial is not meant to be a sequence of steps that you simply copy and paste, but rather to provide you insight, inspiration, and guidance by showing you my workflow. What works for me may not necessarily work for you and your artistic preferences, so I encourage you to take bits and pieces from what I do and incorporate that into your own workflow. All right, with that said, let's jump in and start editing. So while I was in Japan, I had half a day to do some plane spotting at Tokyo's Haneda International Airport. Being a fan of the Pokemon genre, one of the jets I really wanted to catch was ANA's Pokemon Eevee jet, which was painted just several months ago. Thankfully, it did make an appearance towards the end of the spotting day, but by that time, the sky was dark and it was lightly raining, making for a challenging shot and edit. So from the sequence, I picked out a few shots of it taxiing towards the gate. For this editing video, I've decided to edit this one here. I think it's a more interesting angle than a full side-on, and you can still see the livery pretty well. Before I edit any shot, I make sure to zoom in and inspect the photo, especially the plane itself. Usually when I take night photos, I try to use the slowest shutter as I can, so I can take in more light and keep the ISO down. But in this case, since the plane was taxiing towards me and turning, I used a higher shutter of 1 over 40 with an ISO of 6400 to avoid too much motion blur. However, this meant my image would be pretty noisy. You can also see that while the focus near the middle of the plane is good, it gets a little blurry at the tail and the front. This is because I'm using a wide open aperture of f2.8. While f2.8 is great for capturing more light in a darkly lit scene, it means that the depth of field is more prominent. My focus point in this case was in the middle of the plane, so that area is the sharpest. And since the tail and the cockpit are in a different focus plane, they get a bit blurrier. So we're going to try to fix all of that in the post-processing. First things first, I scroll to the bottom of the develop settings and turn off Lightroom sharpening and enable remove chromatic aberration and profile corrections. That should automatically fix the inherent lens distortions of your particular camera and lens. You can see that it automatically detected the Sony and the 70-200 f2.8 lens that I was using. In this case, since I have so much noise in the shot, I like to use the denoise tool in Lightroom, which has actually gotten really good in the past year, sometimes even better than Topaz denoise, especially with low light images. You can pan around and preview the noise reduction within the photo. For a high ISO 6400 shot, I'll probably want to bump it up to about 80. Once you're happy with the amount of noise reduction, click Enhance. Lightroom will take some time to run the denoise algorithm, and once it's done, you can zoom in just to double check everything looks okay. A side effect of denoising is that it can make your image look softer, but that is something we can fix later. The denoise looks pretty clean in this case, so I'm going to keep going. After denoising, I like to do some basic adjustments in Lightroom. In a night scene, there's a tendency for some areas with bright lights to get overexposed in the highlights, such as the nose wheel lighting and some areas of the terminal building back there. When you're checking which areas are overexposed, you can hold the Alt button while dragging the highlight slider. 
Areas shown in white are overexposed. Normally, I like to drag the highlight slider down until no white areas are shown. I also like to bump up the shadows a bit to start recovering and bringing back a bit more light in the scene. I also bump the overall exposure slider up a bit. An important aspect of framing your shot properly is to make sure you have a level horizon, unless you're going for a more artsy crop. What I do is I click on the crop button up here in Lightroom and just hover over the edge of the photo until you see the two arrow icon and drag it up or down. Usually I look at the horizontal or vertical edges of buildings or light posts to make sure I'm leveling it properly. If you have a more obvious horizon, you can just use the ruler tool to trace over the horizon and that will level it automatically. Now it's time to export the image to Photoshop for the more heavy duty editing. Right click the photo, go to export to PSD and choose a location to save your PSD file. So first thing I do after bringing it into Photoshop is to use a tool called Topaz Sharpen AI to sharpen up the image again after the denoising. Now this is not something that comes with Photoshop, it's a paid plugin from Topaz Labs which I highly recommend for recovering motion blur or out of focus shots. Normally, it's $79.99, but it frequently goes on sale, so I would suggest waiting for that if you're planning to pick it up. For full disclosure, I am a Topaz affiliate member and I do get a small kickback from them if you purchase their products through my link. So if this tutorial has helped you and you want to show support for the channel, the best way to help me out is to just go through my links when placing your order, and I would really appreciate that. Alright, so in Topaz Sharpen, depending on the amount of blur you have, I like to select different sharpen modes and try it out. Usually, I start off by trying the standard mode and just previewing different sections of the photo to see how well it sharpens. Sometimes it can produce some weird artifacts, so you need to strike a balance between recovering details and over sharpening with this tool. So after playing around with the settings and sliders, I found a mode and slider setting that seems to work well enough for this photo, so I'm going to hit apply. It will take some time to sharpen, especially if you have a high resolution shot, because it's doing a lot of computation in the background. After it's done sharpening, I usually like to apply an inverse mask on the layer, and using a soft white brush, paint in the areas that I want the sharpening to apply to. I do this because I don't necessarily want the sharpening to happen on the entire photo. This helps with two things, keeping the sharpening artifacts to a minimum, and also to make the plane pop a bit more since it will be sharp, while the background will be a bit softer. Once the sharpening is done, I right click the current layer and click Merge Visible while holding down the Alt key. This will create a new layer with all the previous edits applied to it. I think the photo still looks a bit dark, but instead of just dragging up the exposure, I like to apply a technique called Screen. You'll find this listed as a blending mode if you click on this drop down. Screen is really useful for brightening up the lighter areas of the photo while keeping the dark areas dark thus improving the overall contrast. As you can see, just switching the blend mode to screen instantly brightens the image. But we're not done yet. Right click the layer and go to blending options. While holding down the alt key, drag the left slider to the right and drag the right slider to the left like this. This will help preserve the darkest shadows and the brightest highlights from being affected by the screen layer. Now I'm going to apply a mask on it, and then grabbing a black brush to erase the layer on the terminal building. I don't want to brighten that section at all since it's already pretty bright. Next step is to apply some more contrast to the scene. For this, I love using a tool called NYX Collection Color Effects Pro, specifically the Pro Contrast Filter. It's basically a smarter contrast tool that intelligently applies contrast while still keeping the integrity of the colors and details. For example, here I'm dragging up the dynamic contrast slider and you can see how it makes the colors and light on the plane pop a lot more. It is another paid app and I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I use it on almost every photo I edit, so it's well worth it for me. However, it's not a mandatory tool and you can achieve similar results using just the built-in functions of Photoshop. 
After hitting apply, again I like to do a bit of selective editing by masking out only the area I want this pro contrast filter to apply to. In this case, the plane itself. I see there's some yellow, orange, and brown tones on the airplane, and I want to make them stand out a bit more. So I'll create a new layer, go up to Image, Adjustments, and Selective Color. I'm going to select the yellow color channel, and usually what I do to boost the yellow is to drag the cyan slider to the left. That gives it a bit more presence and warmth. It really depends on the mood you're going for, but in this case, I like the look of that a lot more. Similarly, I'm going to switch over to the red color channel and do the same thing. This does boost the yellowish and red lighting on the tarmac too, so it does depend what effect you're going for. I could create a layer mask and just apply my changes to the plane, but in this case I'm okay with this look, so I'll leave it as it is. Next up, I'm going to create a new layer using Merge Visible again and do some gradient work with the Camera Raw filter. Now it's pretty subjective how you want to apply the gradients and you can get pretty creative with it, but what I like to do is use the gradients to add more depth and make the photo more dynamic. I'm going to start with the gradient from the top down, reducing the exposures a bit and giving it a slight pinkish tint. I want to add another gradient that adds a bit more light from the nose of the plane towards the tail. And finally, restore some of the shadows and darker areas with a dark gradient from the bottom left corner. Again, there's really no one-size-fits-all formula that you can apply to every photo. It really depends how you want to use gradients, if at all, so feel free to experiment and see what works for you, don't just copy what I'm doing here. Every time I adjust the exposure of the image, I make sure to go into the blending options to tweak the sliders here to make sure I'm not blowing out the highlights or crushing the shadows. I think I could use even a bit more light on the plane itself, so I'm going to do the same thing as before. Merge Visible to create another new layer, change the blending mode to screen, and using an inverse mask and a soft brush with a low flow percentage, paint in the areas of the plane I want to brighten a bit more. This layer is going to be more subtle, you don't want to overdo it. Just bumping up the exposure ever so slightly. Next, I decided to bump up the saturation just a bit on the plane, since it's such a colorful livery. I like to give my night shots a soft pink tint, so I'm going to open up Camera Raw again and add a graduated filter to the bottom, set to a pink hue to give the tarmac in the foreground a splash of color. I'll add another one on the bottom left corner here with a darker blue tint to blend with the darker shadows there. At this stage, I'll apply another filter from ColorFX Pro called Tonal Contrast. This is a pretty heavy filter, so I use it sparingly at a reduced strength, and usually only on the plane to bring out some of the reflections. 
As you can see here, I'm using a layer mask that I've used previously and just copying it to this layer so I don't have to paint over the plane again. One of the last steps I like to do to draw the viewer's focus onto the subject is to use a slight vignette that darkens the outside and brightens the center. I'm going to do that with this Color Pro Effects filter called Darken Lighten Center. You could achieve a similar effect with a radial gradient. As a final touch, I'm going to apply a cross-processing filter from ColorFX Pro, just to give it a bit of a moody vibe. Again, these are all just personal preferences and there's really no right or wrong here. Finally, it's time to export our finished edit. A lot of people ask me how I export my photos and how I get such a high quality on Instagram, but honestly I don't do anything special. I just export at highest JPEG quality, usually with a long edge resolution of 5000 pixels, or if exporting for social media like Instagram or Facebook, something like 3000 by 2000 will do. And there you have it, a detailed look at my end-to-end -end workflow for editing a typical night photo. Keep in mind every photo is different. The composition, the colors, the lighting, the amount of noise it has, and even the conditions they were shot in. You're going to have to tailor your workflow to suit each photo. And even with the same photo, there's like a thousand ways to edit it, and there's no right or wrong. It all depends on your own personal preferences, your style, and your creativity. Again, I would encourage you to use this editing walkthrough as more of a guide and a reference, rather than step-by-step -step instructions that you simply copy because that's not going to give you the results that you'll be happy with. And with that, it's time to wrap up another Photoshop editing tutorial. Whether you're a beginner or a seasoned editor, I hope you learned something new. If you did, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more editing tutorials like this one. Also, leave a comment below letting me know what other editing tutorials you would like to see next. Thanks for watching, happy editing, and I'll see you in the next one.